serendipity because when it came together, it really came together. Goodwill, because we just need more goodness in the world these days. And blind faith, because I just didn't know any better. <clears throat> My love for music started in early grade. I played the trumpet in grade school, the baritone horn in high school. I needed something I could backpack with when I was in college, so I played the flute. Um, monkeyed around with the violin, made a couple of them. I'm Irish, so I had to have a boron. Uh, and then, of course, the guitar. But <clears throat> the only thing I can surmise from all this is that I just like to make noise because I really don't have any talent for music, and that's my greatest disappointment in my life. But you keep trying, right? My professional career has been in uh, effects-driven uh, blockbuster movies. I worked for Industrial Light and Magic for a number of years, um, which is the company owned by George Lucas. I worked on Star Wars. I worked on Transformers, Pirates of the Caribbean, A-listed blockbuster movies, effects-driven blockbuster movies. Um, the last, this, this picture down on the right is a picture of the Jurassic Park crew, the, uh, and that was a movie that really changed the industry. The picture over here on the left, your right, excuse me, um, is what I do now, which is um, I run a studio that is practical, so we call that special effects, and basically what we do is we build something and we usually blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> when I turned 50, which is a while ago, um, I decided I need to play the guitar. So I have this friend that works with me at ILM named Jeff Doran, and Jeff's kind of a rocker. He has a band, plays a lot of blues. He's a pretty good friend, and I say to him one day, you know, Jeff, I'd like to play the guitar. And he goes, well, let's, we're in San Francisco. He says, let's go down to the Guitar Center, and we'll find something that would, you could start you off on. So we go to the Guitar Center, and I start playing this, something like this as a PRS, but not quite that model. And um, I'm playing this, no, this is pretty cool, but I don't like electronics, I don't like pedals, I don't like knobs, I don't like amplifiers, I don't like any of that stuff. So I decided to play acoustic guitar. So I played steel string for a while, and it's still not the sound I'm looking for. And then I discovered this thing. And I go, wow, this is cool. It doesn't kill my fingers. It has that sound that I really love. And so I fall in love with the instrument. And as with me, I need to know everything about it. Um, so I read a lot. Um, and I decide, obviously, I need to build one, right? So I go to my friend, Bruce Sexauer, who is a renowned steel string builder. I tell him I want to do this, and he looks at me and says, okay, well, give it a shot. Give me some pointers. I go off. Have a bunch of wood I've collected over the years, and I decide to build a guitar. So my first attempt, I take my box of wood that all my parts, I go back to Bruce, and he looks at him, and he goes, sort of scratches his head, and he goes, you know, Greg, you've done absolutely nothing right here. <laughs> and so, so I say... So you go, oh, damn, you know, and I'm sort of thinking maybe that's the case anyway. Put all the stuff back in a box. This is like 2009, maybe, 2010. Put all the stuff back in a box, throw it in the attic, forget about it for a couple years. Then, about two, early 2019, I'm talking to Bruce again, and Bruce says, Greg, it's just a big card job. He, for, he asked me, did you ever build that guitar? I said, no, it was a disaster. He goes, well, it's just a big card job. And I go, card job? I've, Fingers, every one of my fingers has a scar from carving when I was a Boy Scout. So I'm going, I can carve, and carve myself too, but I can carve. So I decide, pull the wood out, and sort of rejigger it into a nylon string guitar. <clears throat> so I build this. Now, this is going to be steel string guitar, converted it, sounded like a guitar. He said, just build something and see if it sounds like a guitar. So it sounds like a guitar. <clears throat> All my guitars have names. This one is 
was built during COVID-19. It began with COVID-19, so that's its name, COVID-19. Um, all of them have names. I have one called hernia, which was... <laughs> <laughs> I built a guitar with a hernia, and that was really painful. But anyway, um, so things get out of control pretty quickly. <laughs> and um, there's, I think there's 16 guitars right there with me. So what happens in 2019, COVID hits, we all have extra time. So I start building guitars in my extra time. And while I am working on number seven, I'm sitting there working on, I think the top, I was sounding the top or something. And I asked myself this question. Is it possible to put guitars out in the world different than the, rent, the conventional retail route? Because I didn't need to do that. I was doing this for my own passion, right? And most builders will build a guitar to sell. That's their livelihood. It wasn't mine. So I started thinking about what other ways could I do this? And some thoughts, you know, and how do guitars get out into the world? You know, so I thought about the models that are out there. There's you know, violin loans from symphony. For symphonies, a, you know, a museum will have a guitar like out in San Francisco. The Heifetz uh, Guarneri is loaned to the first seat at the symphony. Um, and so there's those kind of things. Then conservatories have what I would call libraries. And most of you probably know this. And the libraries are, you know, a student shows up again with an inadequate instrument. They have a library of instruments that the student can check out for the duration of their, 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 their education. Then they turn the, 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 the guitar back into the library when they're done with their education. Or gifts. So my next question is what would it look like if I could just give away guitars? Could I cover the costs? Probably not. Where would the guitars come from? Maybe a network of luthiers. And I'm, you know, thinking of, I'm rolling all this stuff in my mind. How do you do that? It's going to be a, some sort of philanthropic project. How do you do that? And could I do a nonprofit? So, what are the options? Personal private funding, all right. So I don't really have the funds to do that, so that's not gonna work. Could I do a 501c3 designation? And for those of you who don't know what a 501c3 is, it's a nonprofit organization that has status with the government so that your donor's dollars get tax benefits. And it's kind of a hard thing to get. It takes a while. Um, you're probably gonna need a lawyer. Um, it's going to be not inexpensive to do. It's going to take a lot of time, a year to a year and a half to get it. And my last question was, do I really want to run a 501? Do I really want to run that organization? And my answer to that was no, I didn't really want to run that organization. So <clears throat> then I find out there's this thing called sponsorship. And this is the whole crux of why I can do what I do. <clears throat> I have a friend who's in the 501 world, and we're talking one day, and she's sort of explaining what she does, and I'm going, I'm sort of scratching my head, not getting it. It took me a while to understand it. <clears throat> but basically, um, A five, the, the, the sponsor, fiscal sponsorship model is a company has a 501c3 designation. They have a mission and a program, and they can hang different projects under that 501 designation so that all those projects, when their money comes in, can get, their donors can get tax benefit. So, it's like a corporation with a bunch of ancillary programs to it, right? So, 
I finally understand what this 501 thing is all about. And I go to uh, Rune Link and I ask and I see, could we actually do this? Could, could, could this program come, come under your um, purview and excuse me uh, okay so this is a Merlin Link sponsorship page it sort of explains what they do we talked a moment about benefits of fiscal sponsorship. Again, I don't have to go through the whole thing of getting a 501 designation. It's already there. <clears throat> Lowers the barrier of entry for many projects. I think this particular program has had between 70 and 144 projects under its umbrella. Provides managerial support. Any questions I have, I can get answered. I don't have to run my own organization. They run it for me, and there's oversight for my donor funds. So, <clears throat> 20, July of 2021 is when my first discussions about this started, and I asked, you know, what am I going to need to do this? Well, you're going to need a business plan to get 501 designation and come under our umbrella. <clears throat> we'll get tax advantage of donors by that. You're going to need a website. You're going to have, a, have to have a presence. Um, you're going to have to find donors. You're going to have to find recipients. You're going to have to figure out who those recipients are. You're going to have to connect with institutions. You're going to have to figure out how to deliver your guitars. You're going to have to figure out how to track what happens, because donors like to know where their money goes and what happens with it. So, in the process of writing my business plan, I go online and I steal some pictures, which I probably shouldn't have, but I love this picture of Elliot here, um, because that's what I was dreaming. I, you know, to me, that's a dream picture, right? So there's only eight copies of this, so I didn't think you'd have too much problem if I borrowed this picture. Um, and I write my business plan. And my first attempts were okay, but it took me about 26 attempts to get it right. And the reason it took 26 attempts to get it right was because I was talking to everybody and I was taking everybody's feedback. And I came up against this interesting little quirk about this. And this, I'm going to come back to this, but this is, there's your vision of what your project is. And then there's potentially your donor's vision of what your project should be. And this causes not friction, but it causes you to rethink things because early on, when you don't have money, you, you don't, it's hard to not say yes to money. So I try to incorporate my donors, all my donors, into my business plan. It's a little watered down, but still the core of it is still there. I get accepted into um, Marin Link, and I keep refining and refining, and so. From July to about August, I go through this process. In August, early September, I get um, accepted and Gift the Guitar is real. We start our operation. So, <clears throat> how do you find people and how do you establish awareness? And this is kind of one of those things you have to overcome because the way I found it is through a number of ways, I'm gonna tell those stories, but I surf the internet, I look for email blasts, I, you know, I, I talk to anybody, come to these kind of things, talk to people here. But one of the things that I find is that when I'm looking for, for people, I'll find their programs. For instance, I found this program, it's a great guitar program at the University of Boulder, um, University of Colorado Boulder, uh, which I spent a year at. Uh, it's called the Ritter Classical Guitar Program. And I'm going, wow, maybe that's somebody I should talk to. It's impossible to find Michael and Mickey's contacts. And 
they're not going to give them to you at their at, at the university because and I wouldn't either. So those are frustrations you have to overcome as you're doing this. So let's get back to this thing about money. Um, there's right money and there's wrong money. And right money is you have a vision, you stick to your vision, a donor buys into your vision, they give you money for it, you're off and running. Wrong money is you have a vision, the donor thinks they know better what you should be doing with their money. For instance, my vision is students in conservatory programs of need, with talent, bring them up to speed, get them a guitar that they can, that they can compete with. That's my vision. It's really simple. Get a luthier-made guitar, put it in the hand of a student of need, and let them go. One of my bigger donors says to me, you know, that's okay. I mean, that's a great idea, but I'd like to see my money spread around a little bit more. Why don't you start some programs in schools, and you do this, you do that. And I said, well, that's not really my vision. Yeah, it could be done, but it's being done by other people. Um, this is a unique vision here. And they say, well, you know, really would like to see it. So I incorporate their ideas into my, into my, into my business plan, specifically because I was starting off and turning down money when you're starting off is really hard to do. Because first off, it's hard to come by. So again, maybe sometimes you're better, as, as, as I get more established and I have more donor input and more donors, I'll be able to say, you know, that's a great idea, but it's not my idea, so maybe you shouldn't give me your money. And I hope to get to that point. So a couple things I need to do Connect with the right people, both donors, participants, teachers, institutions. Learn how to sell my idea. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever had was from a woman in um, where I live, fairly wealthy. She says, Greg, wealthy people like to be asked for money, but you need to tell a story. You need to have a story to tell, because they want to hear a story. And I've got a story. Wait you hear this. So, and you need to spend your money wisely and protect it. So, on the last point, spending your money wisely, but what's a wise use of your money? The wise use of your money is taking the money that's given to you and putting it in to guitars for kids, all right? A not wise use for money is maybe traveling. So my first idea when we started this whole thing was I would travel, I'd give the guitar to the kid or the student, and uh, that'd be on a fly home, right? Well, it's not a really great use of money, but I did it on the first one and that was pretty important to do. So. September 2021, oh, excuse me, let me, one more slide here. So I, at this point, it's uh, September, October, I pause, I reevaluate, I try to improve everything. Um, and then I start to figure out what else I need and what else is going to cost. You know, so there's business cards, a website, brochures. Am I ever going to do sponsor appreciation? Not, not really, not right. Not, you know, I do handwritten letters to my sponsors. Um, organizational merchandise, this flag was a wise use of funds. It was about $340 or something. Because when I go to a, this was at the Mill Valley uh, Music Festival, when I go there and I stake this 14 foot flag in the, in the ground, I kind of have a presence and people come by and want to know what it's about. So in September of 2021, Gifted Guitar is real. It took about five months to put it together. And that's the goal, right? Turn donations into guitars, right? <clears throat> I need to build a network of luthiers, and I have the, the great 
um, goodwill to be working with one of the best luthiers in the business, Kenny Hill. And Kenny's guitar, the stuff coming out of his shop right now is just phenomenal. So I get to work with Kenny. Uh, he helps me. Um, I need to get a network of, of teachers to find the most deserving talent. And I need to find recipients. And my profile, again, is basically somebody in a conservatory program with talent, wants to have a, music, a career in music, and is of need. So usually those people are on scholarship. So then at the very end of it all, <clears throat> you make the gift and you deliver it, then you gotta track it and see if you can track it. Now this is the interesting thing about tracking. <clears throat> Students in colleges these days have email addresses at their college. That's not the address you want. You want their personal address because once they graduate, you're gonna lose track of them. And I have actually lost track of one person. I'm sure he'll come back, but I've currently lost track of one person. So anyway, we get to this point, if the guitar is real, and now some really interesting things start to happen. And this is the story of how the first guitar got gifted. So I'm sitting at my desk at work one day, and I get this in an email. And I look at that, and I go, mentorship program, what the hell is that? I'm sort of new to the GFA, I'm new to the whole thing. And so I call the GFA and just, Believe it or not, this nice young lady answers the phone. And she says, I explain her what, her doing, what I'm doing, and she says, well, you really need to talk to our general manager, Connie Shu." And so I said, okay, well, can you connect me with Connie? She says, yeah, but Connie's on vacation right now. <clears throat> so she'll call you when she gets back. So I tell her, give her my contact information, hang up the phone and go, and, yeah, that's probably going nowhere. So then, about two weeks later, this wonderful person calls me. <laughs> Connie calls me. I explain what I'm doing. Wow, what a great idea, Greg. And if I had a dime for every time I've heard that since I started this program, we'd all be having coffee and donuts right now. <laughs> so anyway, she says, let me think about it. So again, we hang up, she has my contact information, I hang up the phone. And I go, well, that's going to go nowhere. And sure enough, two weeks later, she calls me. And she says, Greg, I actually have these two teachers out in Cleveland. They're out of student. Eric Mann and Steve Aaron. Eric is the Cleveland Classical Guitar, Guitar Society Executive Director, really nice guy. And Steve Aaron, another really nice guy. <clears throat> Which brings me to a real quick point. Everybody I've met that has anything to do with classical guitars, really great people. I just have to say, really great people. So I call them and I say, so guys, I hear you have a student. And they say, yeah, we have this guy, this kid, who um, has a lot of talent. He just got a full ride to Oberlin. And... Um, he really has an inadequate guitar. And this is the kid. So Damien, in the Cleveland world, and I, some of you probably know of him, <clears throat> Damien is this kid, and his story is fantastically interesting. He comes from inner city Cleveland. He's the first kid in his family to graduate from high school and go to college. He is 14 years old at the time, and one of his teachers says, Damien, I think you should go do the after-school guitar program. And he goes to the teacher, I don't want to do that. The teacher says, you might want to. And Damien's thinking, well, God, if I want to keep my grade up in this class, maybe I'd better do this. So Damien goes off and checks out the guitar program, finds out he's a natural. He has so much talent. He, there's something about his brain that just meshes with the classical guitar. So Damien starts playing, and in a very short amount of time, he's 
selected to be one of the, he's selected for the mentorship program for the GFA. He's a Cleveland Institute Artist Fellowship Fellow. Uh, upon graduation from high school, he gets a full ride to Oberlin College. He composes. He went to the U.S. He went with the U.S. Guitar Orchestra to Spain, and I could go on. He's an extremely unusual talent, to say the least. So while all this is going on, I have this guy come to my studio and say, "Greg, I've got this guy that has these guitars and he wants to record them." Can you help me out and give me a break on the stage rate? So I say, yeah, I can do that. So he shows up with this gentleman. Now, Jeff Wells is an interesting guy. He has about 50 what I would call pre-modern guitars in a collection that he named after his kids, Austin and Marty. So he has this thing, and if you ever have a chance, you should look it up. It's really a fantastic collection, and the book he published is phenomenal. So, I say, can you get me in touch with, with Jeff? Because I figured Jeff might have an idea of something that could, that could help me. At this point, I'm not looking for money. I just want advice. So I have Jeff. He finally gets back to me. And I, said, I tell him what I'm doing. He goes, yeah, Greg, you don't want to talk to me. You, you, I'm not the guy you want to talk to. You want to talk to this guy named Chris Mallet. I'm going, well, who the hell is that? So he gets me in contact with this guy. Now, most of you probably know who this is. Chris, great guy, <clears throat> I finally get a hold of him, it takes me a while, he's a busy guy, it takes me a while, I finally get a hold of Chris, I tell him what I'm doing, and he goes, I say, Chris, I'm trying to get this guitar for a kid in Cleveland, I just wondered if you had any advice for me, and he goes, well, who's the kid in Cleveland you're trying to get this guitar for? He goes, his name, I say, his name is Damien Gogut, and he goes, well, that's funny, I was his mentor for the summer. Now I'm scratching my head, but mm, that's interesting. Okay, so he says to me, he says, if you really want to get Damien a great guitar, <clears throat> get him a Glen Cannon. And I go, who the hell's Glen Cannon? Well, Chris says to me, he lives in that city north of, north of the Golden Gate. And I'm going, you mean Sausalito? And he goes, no, 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 the other one. You mean Mill Valley? And he goes, yeah, yeah, that one. He lives in Mill Valley, and I'm, I live in Mill Valley. So I'm going, what the hell? I'm talking to him, and I'm looking at Glen Cannon, and I find out that Glen lives a mile from my house. So <clears throat> while this is going on, I'm having another discussion with Jeff, and I'm telling him what's happening, and Jeff says, I'll give you some more money so you can get Damien a really nice guitar, because my price point was not a Glen Cannon price point. So now I've got enough money that if I want to get a Glen Cannon, I have the money for it. So <clears throat> I go see this guy. Call Glenn. Say, Glenn, I'm around the corner from you. Can I come see you? Go, show, go tell Glenn what I'm doing. He goes, wow, that's a great idea, Greg. I love the idea. So I say, so what's your build time? What's your wait time? He goes, it's two and a half years. I go, well, damn, that's not going to work for Damien. Then he gets a sly look on his face and he goes, well, actually, I have, a, I have a customer who's sitting back at 650 and wants a 640 scale guitar. And you can have that one. And I'm just, now I'm really scratching my head because these things are starting to really come together for Damien. And I go, damn. And he says, it'll be ready in about a month. It has a scratch. I need to get that scratch fixed because that's just the way I am. And then <clears throat> while this is going on, Connie had told me that it would be best if, a, if somebody could pick their guitar. So I had this in my mind that we needed to go pick a guitar. So I call Armin Kelly, Guitars International, who I've talked to over the years. And I say, Armin, can you curate four or five guitars? We come out and test them. I'm bringing a Glen Cannon. He says, you can't bring the Glen Cannon to my shop. I go, fine. <clears throat> so get Glenn's guitar. Um, go out to Cleveland with it, play the Glen Cannon in this room at the hotel I was staying at, really nice hotel, and then we go over to Shaker Heights, which is just out of, out of Cleveland, and we go to Armin's shop, and um, we have Damien play four or five guitars, and there was one guitar that he kind of gravitated towards. 
And he was thinking about it. He says, I want to go back and play the Glen Cannon. So now we get back in the car, we go have lunch, and we go back to the hotel, and he plays the Glen Cannon. And he loves it. So this is Damien with his guitar, the first guitar we gave. This would be November of 2021. And uh, he was ecstatic. He was so ecstatic that um, there was... And this guitar is such a special guitar is that that I was sitting in Kenny Hill's um, showroom one day, and Kenny was talking to a student from Oberlin, and I said, oh, you know, you know Damien? And he goes, yeah, and Damien's guitar is fantastic. So the kid knew of the guitar. I thought that was really interesting. So what else have we done? <clears throat> I talked to uh, Steve Aaron, and Steve, or actually Steve calls me one day. He says, Greg, are you looking for more students? And I said, yes, I am, because I do have funds for it. And he says, well, there's this guy named Stanley Yates. He's at Austin P, smaller university with a great program. So I call Stanley. Stanley has a student, Chaz Privet. Now, Chaz is kind of an interesting story. Chaz was homeschooled um, up through high school, um, put himself through school, has a little bit of a, a scholarship to help him. And he is the only student that Stanley has ever given private lessons to outside the university. He's the only student he's ever given private lessons to. That's how much he believed in chess. So we were talking. And <clears throat> at this point, I go to Kenny Hill, and I say, Kenny, I've got this student I need a guitar for. And so we sit down with Kenny. I sit down with Kenny, and we go through a bunch of his guitars, and we select out this beautiful signature guitar, raised fingerboard, double top, package it up, send it to Stanley, to present to Chaz. Chaz is beside us. Wow. Then, <clears throat> Steve Aaron also turns me on to this guy, Doug James. Apparently, Doug just, grad just um, retired. You just heard that today. Um, and he has two students that don't fit my profile perfectly, but their stories were compelling enough that I really wanted to do, do something for them. So, Beckett and Tanner have a fairly similar story. You know, they, they, they come from, you know, backgrounds that aren't, you know, one of them has a parent who's a teacher, and we know how much money teachers make, and uh, uh, what, actually they both, I think, have parents that are teachers. Um, and um, they're in their sort of their third year in the program, and they're getting ready to get out, and they're going to have to give back their guitars, because they had loaners from the university. And so I had this in my mind, and I talked to Doug probably in November, December of 21, and so in about April of 22, I called Doug, and he goes, wow, I didn't expect to ever hear from you again, Greg. I said, no, you guys have been in my back of my mind. I have two guitars and two of my personal guitars that I don't play that I'd love to give these kids. So I sent a Sakurai Kono, which is on the left, and a uh, Manuel Rodriguez, which is on the right, both really nice guitars. Doug gets them and he goes, wow, these are fantastic. The kids are going to love them. And they did. They were, they were so happy. Beckett is now going on to a master's program. <coughs> and then, the most recent guitar we've done, <coughs> again, I'm at my desk one day, recently, very recently, and Andy York has this thing that he puts out um, on Monday morning. It's called Monday Memories. And it's a... YouTube video that you can watch and you sort of get your day going with some of his music. It's really a great idea. And so, <clears throat> Andy, I'm reading the thing underneath the, the, the morning memory thing, the Monday memories um, thing, and I'm reading what it's about. And it's apparently the student of a guy named Joe Pecoraro that wants Andy to create a piece of music and dedicate it to his previous teacher. So, and I'm reading this, I'm going, well, who's this guy? So I look him up, and I call him. And I go, Joe, this is what I do. Do you have anybody that might fit my profile? I tell him what my profile is. He goes, actually, I do, Greg. He goes, I have two students. One young lady, again, underprivileged background, scholarship, the whole profile. And I have one student from Vietnam who just has a completely inadequate guitar. I said, well, okay, so who has the most potential to have a, a career in music? 
And he, I said, you got to pick one, Joe. So he says, actually, Olivia does. So this is Olivia. And I go back to Kenny. Kenny sits with me. We find this really beautiful double top uh, new century guitar from his shop. And we package it up and we send it to Joe. Joe presents it to Olivia. Olivia's beside herself. So, what have we learned from all this? Looking for areas to reduce costs so I can improve the impact, right? So the impact is about getting luthier make guitars, turning donations into luthier make guitars, giving them to students in need. I think critically about the value the program adds. And I trust myself and my network that I've created. So, one of the most important things I learned was that traveling is not a great use of my donor funds, although some traveling is. Um, traveling to deliver a guitar is just not tenable. Uh, um, so that's why now I package up the guitar, we send them out of Kinney's shop, and um, cost, you know, $210 maybe. Uh, FedEx and it FedExes in two days and it gets to where it's going and we haven't had a problem at this point. Um, the other thing I learned is the idea of picking out a guitar is not tenable for my program and I'm pretty much assured that an upgrade from what the student has so what I'm going to give them, they're going to be completely happy with. And we try, I try to give them a choice. And the choices are like four. 640, 650 scale, cedar, spruce, and if we can, a double top. And the reason we do a double top is because of projection and my feeling is, is that I want my kids heard in their classes. So, looking forward. Oh, excuse me, sorry. I'm looking for connections, which are really important for most, uh, for in donate, what the connections are students, finding those students, finding the money. I have some good Luthier connections right now, and involvement. Um, And I need to clean up my story. I, I need to, I'm not, it's not that I'm not a gregarious person, but I'm not a person that's comfortable in a crowd of people I don't know. And I really have to fix that. So these are some things that I'm working on, because if I'm gonna tell a story, I need to be present, I need to be engaged. And this is, you know, most everything that I've ever done in my life, I've done by myself. Um, all my sports are singular sports. Um, you know, I swim, I, you know, I ride bikes, and you know, it's all pretty singular, and that's kind of who I am, but I sort of have to break out of that shell to be able to, especially, to find the donors that I need. And if you could tell people about my program, I'd really be, appreciate it. Thanks. that I could answer, you know, maybe something I didn't cover well enough, or, yeah, over here. Um, just about what's the farthest distance of a student that you've serviced, or like the farthest... How far will I go with my guitars? Yes. Um, I think it's a little bit longer than that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, do you have a relationship with one or more guitar case companies to provide appropriate cases? Yeah, I don't. And the cases currently um, currently come with the guitars, and, and most of the guitars that we've gifted right now are from Finish Shop. Um, uh, but no, I don't. Um, and when I started this program, I thought I had reached out to uh, I think it was I think it's called Cross Rock or something. Mm -hmm. Just because I kind of thought their cases were cool, um, and I and they said, yeah, we could we could give you a dealer discount on them and that kind of thing. But I just haven't had the need to do that. Um, that doesn't mean I won't in the future. Yeah, here. <clears throat> Two questions. And one, I, I came in a little late. You might have said that's okay. Uh, you apply the three. Uh, I, okay. So the, the the whole point of the way I, the reason I can do this is because I have fiscal sponsorship under a organization called Marin Link out in California where I live that is an umbrella organization that they have 501c3 sponsorship and they sponsor projects and if your project meets their mission statement they'll take you on and so now that I have now that I have the 501 you know I have a way to donate I have a way for my donors to get tax benefits and all those kind of things and uh, yeah so basically I do my next question kind of ties into that do you, is there any part of your program right now, or do you anticipate in the future uh, doing a legacy program? So for those of us that, that have quality guitars uh, that we're not going to have family sell, that could be gifted to your program? Absolutely. I have thought about that. Again, it's a matter, it's a matter of connections, you know, making those connections to people. I have this dream, right? So. Um, most of you probably know of a company in the, uh, out in California, in L.A., called uh, Guitar Salon. And Guitar Salon has a whole bunch of guitars. They also have a foundation. And the way their foundation started was a woman had a husband who collected very expensive guitars. When he died, she took the guitars and gave them based that they would start a foundation for kids in the L.A. area to learn music. <clears throat> guitar specifically. So they took these guitars, <clears throat> very expensive guitars, and then they sold them and they used that money to populate the LA school district with guitars and classes and teachers and all these things. So that was one thing I thought. I'm not sure that that's the right way to go, but yeah, it's, that has been in the back of my mind. But again, it's about connections. Who has those guitars? Where do they come from? Um, do I want a kid, give a kid a Hauser? I don't think so. Could I give a kid, could I give 10 kids guitars for the price of that Hauser? Probably. So it would be something like, does that answer your question? Well, well yeah, I, I, I think that, because I can't even imagine in my own family um, even having to think this idea how to go about selling these guitars. Yeah. And fortunately, I. My, one of my dearest friends is, is a luthier, and my wife knows to call him. Um, but I, I thought about this a lot. Yeah. This sort of thing. Be, you know, it, it's, it's my hope that, that people like you, and, and, and people do have, and they learn about the program, and they think, well, instead of just, I've collected these guitars over the years, they've meant a lot to me, maybe they could do something good for somebody else in the world. And that's kind of where I'm at. So, yes, absolutely would be like beyond my wildest dream. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, sponsorship um, mm -hmm. Marin. Mm -hmm. um, how does Marin raise money and then how does it trickle down to you and what's in it for them? Okay, that's, so that's Mary doesn't this. raise money for me. Okay. Mary raises money for her own organization and she has her own projects. Okay. I raise money for Gift the Guitar myself okay. and with my people. And um, how does it, it doesn't trickle down, it goes into my bank account. So if a donor donates to me, it goes into my bank account. And yes, there is a fee. I pay 8% of my donations are to help cover their overhead and stuff to take care of me. If I get big enough, I'll probably, you know, if I get, if I get big enough and it, it, it really does end up taking off and uh, I get some substantial funding that I can count on, then I'll probably, uh, apply for my own 501 designation, but that that is a whole different ball of wax. I mean, yeah. do I want to 
right now, I have no interest in running a 501c3 organization. I don't want to deal with the government. I don't want to do all that stuff. So, and I'm trying to get this off the ground. You know, I've done five kids so far, which isn't a lot, but it is a lot. You know, it's a lot of money so far. Um, so, you know, the, I think the guitar is probably, by the time it's all said and done, are between eight and ten thousand dollars for these kids. So, you know, it's not an insignificant program or an amount of money. So, but yeah, the funds come directly into my account, my bank account under Bryn Link, and then they get disseminated to me, and then that percentage for overhead to Bryn Link. So that so Mary, oh Mary, I get confused. I thought Marin was the name of it. It's Marion as a person who started. It's Marin Link is the name Marin of the company. Link. Is Marin Link. Marin Link. Right. And it's um, so they're their own organization. Correct. And they're just sponsoring you. They sponsor what they do. So is, that you is, don't they have to go sponsor a community um, community organ. So for instance, one of the programs. This is kind of interesting. One of the programs under their under their umbrella is a community garden. So these people want to build a community garden, they want to collect funds for it, they, they want to do it in the nonprofit sector, and then they want, to, and they want to support it. So they have this concept, and they go to Marin Link, and they say, this is what we want to do. And they say, okay, write a business plan, come up with a solid program, let me know who the players are, and if all that works, and we believe in you, we're going to, we'll sponsor you. And then they get sponsored, and they have, and then that gives them the ability to use a 501c3 designation. Okay. So when you say sense? sponsor, there's like no money coming from them. It's just they're just. They sponsor you fiscally. They sponsor you by having you under their umbrella. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Remember, I've been on boards for 501c's, and oh, okay. it's a lot of work. It just as a board member. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, and that's that's why that's why it's kind of a beautiful model for somebody like me, because yeah, it's eight percent, but God, there's a lot of stuff I'm not dealing with, you know, and I didn't and I didn't I didn't have to apply, I didn't have to get lawyers involved, I didn't have to take big fees and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's the beauty of it, yeah. to get off the ground. And then if it takes off and goes crazy, yeah, maybe I will, you know, at some point, or maybe I won't. You know, um, I know Marin Mike just had a very high-end program, come back to them and say, you know, we don't want to do this 501c3 business anymore. We just want to be sponsored. We don't want to run our own program. It's too, it's just too much. So, that's the beauty of it. Any other questions over here? Yeah, I was just looking at your website and I had a few questions. I was wondering if you uh, plan on releasing, like, the cost breakdown of how exactly, or where exactly the donated money goes. So you said 8% goes to the mm -hmm. company, like, what okay, the good question. Where does the money go? I don't take anything out of the money. And the only money that doesn't go into guitars is uh, that 8%. Everything else goes into the organization. Right, so I did, like, for example, before I donate, I would like to know how much of it is going to, let's say, like, advertising and then, like, the Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I don't have an exact breakdown, but it's not a lot. I mean, my website's pretty inexpensive. It, it costs, the website costs about $2,000 to get put together, which is not unheard of. Um, I don't, you know, my brochures that you all have, you know, they're a couple hundred dollars. My business cards are a couple hundred dollars. Um, that's kind of, you know, those, the, those are the expenses that you're, you, the, the biggest expenses you're up against are your website and then your ancillary materials, you know, because a startup, non-profit startup, is really, you know, when I started this, it was just me, and now I have help, but um, it's, it's and, and the idea is to keep, your, to keep your expenses way down. So the one thing I did do is I traveled to deliver Damien's guitar, and I thought that was important for the first one, just so I could get the feeling of what the whole thing was. So in your first year, you're going to find out that you're going to spend money that you probably, in retrospect, could have not, could have used better. But it's the learning experience, you know? And I'm very upfront. I send my donors a complete read down of what happened that year um, to explain everything I've done, who I've given guitars to, where the money's gone. So I'm very transparent, and that's very important to me. Uh, the other thing that's important to me is that the luthiers get paid a fair price for their guitars. 
because if you figure out how long a luthier makes, takes to make a guitar, and you figure out what they sell it for, they're lucky to make 30 bucks an hour, maybe 25. So I believe they should be supported. My next question was, so on the website, it didn't seem like there was a clear way for students to apply. Is this mostly like a word of mouth? Good morning. It's a good question, and this is one of those areas that I need to tighten up. There is not. There is going to be. There is not right now because usually what I'm doing right now is I reach out to a teacher like Joe or, you know, Stanley or, or Doug. I reach out to a teacher and, um, and they tell me what they, if they have a student that fits my profile. Now, you have my business card. You have my email address on the back of that brochure. Send me an email and put gift the guitar in the, in, in the, um, in the uh, subject line, and I'll look at it. Yeah? I just have a follow-up to his question. I mean, we ballpark figure, you know, off the top of your head, would you say your admin costs are less than 20% of the budget? Absolutely. That's a very good ratio. I've sat yeah. on boards for, like I said before, and you know what you look for, what a lot of uh, arts organizations and rebranding organizations look for is what ratio you're spending on admin to actually the money going. I'm to way the below that. Yeah, if I'm, you're less than twenty percent. I'm way below twenty percent. That's, that's uh, well, yeah. then you're hitting like Ted Williams. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, way in the back. I'm curious. How is the determination made that a uh, needy, deserving student in um, conservatory or academic program um, needs an eight to $10,000 instrument as opposed to something a bit less expensive? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, when I started, and the, the price point now is a little bit less than that, but uh, because I found some great guitars that are not quite that expensive, um, my feeling was is that I want to give these guys a leg up a solid leg up, and that's really where that comes from. So when you know, I built, I have a lot of luthier friends, I know what guitars cost, I know what classical guitars cost, I know what good classical guitars cost, and uh, my feeling was, is yeah, I could get them, something that would get them through school, but I want to look beyond that. I want to look at their career, and I want to hopefully give them a guitar that they can take into their career. And that's why that price point sort of came up when I was you know, like scanning the world for, for what that price point might be. Um, it's, uh, and I'm trying to, to refine that a little bit. Now it's moved down a little bit to, you know, the sweet point right now is around six. But I don't think it's going to go much lower than that. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.